Good morning. My name is Minister Donald Reeves. I am the son of the house at Macedonian Missionary Baptist Church in Moultrie, Georgia. And I serve under the leadership of Reverend Ellis Goose, who is the pastor of Macedonia. And uh, I'm, I was, I'm the Sunday school teacher. And uh, during this pandemic, we're, we're currently, we're not open right now. We're in the process of leading up to that reopening. But just sharing a few things on the channel. And I said to myself, I guess I'll go ahead and do a Sunday school lesson to keep myself busy while we're going. Now, once the pandemic is over and the pastor will have access to the channel and he can use it in any manner that he sees fit. So, so I got together tonight. I want to bring a Sunday school lesson to you today. Amen. Our Sunday school lesson, our Sunday school lesson for the week of October 18th, 2020, our lesson is lesson number three. And the subject this morning is meeting the needs of others. Our print passage is Luke 10th chapter 25th through the 37th verse. I'll go ahead and I'll read the scriptures to you. And then I'll discuss each scripture individually during the lesson. It says, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, what is written in the law and how readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him, and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Amen. Now in the passage just prior to our text today, Jesus sent out 70 of his followers in pairs to proclaim through word and deed that the kingdom of God is come now unto you. Both Jesus and his 70 followers, uh, his uh, emissaries, rejoiced at God's power working through them. So immediately preceding our lesson today, Jesus spoke with his 70 followers at the conclusion of their fruitful mission. And although some commentators view Jesus' interaction with this lawyer as an interruption of his debriefing discussion with the disciples, the exact time and place of the scene is unspecified, but it does happen right after that. So our first verse today, verse 25 says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, this man wasn't a lawyer in the sense that's familiar to us, but rather he was a scholar educated in the Old Testament law and the Jewish tradition surrounding the law. The fact that the lawyer stood up indicated that Jesus was speaking and his followers or his listeners were sitting because this was a typical respectful pose when listening to a rabbi teach. Now, the idea of tempting Jesus is the same as when Jesus was tempted in Matthew 4, verses 1 through 10, which can be appropriately called a test. Now, evidently, the lawyer wasn't sincerely in seeking to be taught by Jesus as much as he was interested in how Jesus would answer. We have to wonder if the lawyer was trying to show Jesus up. By calling him master, 
the lawyer would at least wanted to give the impression that he respected Jesus. His question conveyed a perspective of salvation by works, and yet his response to Jesus' own question showed that the lawyer knew that mere works alone without faith are dead. In verse 26, Jesus said unto him, what is written in the law and how readest thou? So instead of answering immediately, Jesus asked his own questions, given the fact that the questioner or the man lawyer who was questioning him was a Jewish scholar, it's only fitting that Jesus asked him how he read and interpreted the law. Verse 27 says, And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. Now the lawyer's reply alludes to the great Shema of Deuteronomy 6 chapter in the fifth verse. And the Shema is just that. It's something that Jews today recite daily, that thou shalt love the God with all thy heart, all thy mind, and all thy soul. But look what the lawyer did. He added the law of neighborly love that is found in Leviticus in 19th and 18th chapter that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So these answers show that the lawyer knew that mere rule keeping was not the path to life. Instead, the love of God and the combination of loving your neighbor leads to life. So this combination of loving the Lord your God and loving your neighbor as yourself has become known as the great commandment. Verse 28 says, and he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. So Jesus' seemingly final words to the lawyer was this commendation that he had answered the question correctly. But then verse 10, 29 tells us something. It says, But he, we're talking about the lawyer, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? The lawyer found himself challenged, and so he looked to justify himself. And although the lawyer acknowledged that previously that Leviticus 19th and the 18th chapter is a summary statement about loving thy neighbor as thyself, he used the word neighbor. He, he took it all out of context. You see, in the original context of the word neighbor, the fellow Israelites, it, it talked about the love that they had for their fellow Israelites, and even that love was extended to strangers who came and lived to the land and lived among the Jews. Now, the land of Israel in Jesus' time was occupied by the Romans, and therefore it was comprised of many, many people who were not Israelites. So with his question, the lawyer clearly seemed to be trying to distinguish or make a distinction, making the point that some people are neighbors and thus are required to be loved. He's talking about the Jew, and then some are not. And he was talking about the ones that were not Jews that were living among the Jews. So the notion that some people are not neighbors is what Jesus addressed in this parable. Verse 30 says, And Jesus answering and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. So rather than answering the lawyer's question directly, Jesus told a story. And like other Jewish teachers in his time, Jesus used a parable to explain a scripture text. In this case, he wanted to explain Leviticus 19th chapter and the 18th verse. And since the details of parables were true to life, we can increase our knowledge or understanding of this parable by exploring the historical culture and context that was supporting it. You see, although Jesus' audience likely assumed the opening character to have been a Jew, Jesus never specified his identity. The man remains anonymous throughout the story. And since Jerusalem is 25 feet above sea level and Jericho is 800 feet below sea level, a traveler setting out from Jerusalem certainly would have to go down in order to reach Jericho. And winding his way down through this rocky desert, this 17-mile 
stretch of road that was infamous for danger, the caves along the way presented these ample opportunities to ambush somebody. Jesus focused on the violent mistreatment that the man received at the hand of the thieves. They were not content to simply take his raiment, his garments. Uh, no, no, the thieves left him for dead. So one would hope that these evildoers were the only characters in the parable to show such callous disdain for human life. But as we go into our next two verses, we see that that is not the case. Verses 31 and 32. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Priests who were descendants of Levi and Aaron served as God's representatives to the people. And Levites served as assistants to priests. So why didn't these servants of God serve the wounded man? Well, some speculate that, speculate that they feared that the thieves may be hiding in the caves, and thus if they stopped to help him, then they would be attacked as well. Or perhaps some speculate that they feared becoming ceremonially unclean, by ritually, or ritually unclean, by touching a dead person, and thus that would make them unable to fulfill their religious duties by touching what appeared to be a dead body. But that latter one about unceremonially unclean and stuff, that argument has been countered by geography. You see, to go down from Jerusalem indicated that they, were, that they had completed their temple responsibilities and they were heading home. In addition, the Jewish practice was to bury a dead person on the same day. So this should have compelled both the lawyer and the Levite to investigate the victim's status with regard to that requirement of being buried the same day that they die. But before we get too deep in the uh, uh, mind reading and speculation, we remind ourselves, or I'd like to remind you, that this is only a fictional story, a parable to make a point. And since no motive is stated by Jesus, there is no motive to be discerned. The characters of the negligent priest and the Levite serve only as a backdrop to what comes next. Verse 33, but a certain Samaritan as he journeyed came where he was and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. When the Northern kingdom of Israel was exiled to Assyria earlier, some, some Israelites were left behind. And they, and, and they began to marry with the people that were brought into the land after they were taken into exile. And this resulted in the population known as the Samaritans. Now, the difference between the Samaritans and the Jews is that the Samaritans only believe in the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses. They believe that God must be worshipped on a mountain called Gerizim rather than in Jerusalem. And the Jews in Jesus' day, they despised the Samaritans and they refused to associate with them. And of course, the feeling was mutual. But needless to say, a Samaritan would be the last person a Jew would expect to show compassion to another Jew. Verse 34, and went to him and bound up his wound, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. In stark contrast to the inactivity of the priest and the Levite, the Samaritan actively ministered to the needy man. Both Jews and Greeks appear to have used wine and oil in those days for medical purposes. Uh, the, the, the wine was used to clean the wound out and the oil was used as an antiseptic and even uh, uh, olive oil would, would be used to ease the man's pain. But they said, then the Samaritan set the man on his uh, donkey, which means he himself now had to walk. And in those days, inns where you stayed, looking like a hotel, there were places of potential danger. Not only were you in danger of being robbed by thieves, but you also can potentially be murdered. But from the beginning to end, 
the Samaritan considered the care of the injured man of greater value than the risk involved of his own life. Verse 35. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and he gave them to the host. And he said unto him, take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Some scholars estimate that two pence would have been enough to pay for room and board for two months. But by entering in such an, and by entering into an opening an agreement like that, the Samaritan also set himself up to possible extortion. He could have left and came back and the innkeeper could say, well, you owe me five more pence because I had to do so-and-so, so-and-so. But just like when Jonathan interceded with his father, King Saul, on David's behalf, here the Samaritan interceded on the wounded man's behalf. And both Jonathan and the Samaritan demonstrated faithful love. So when I bring up Jonathan and David, I'm talking about faithful love because Jonathan went against his father's wishing and he helped David because David and Jonathan had made a covenant and Jonathan really and truly loved David. So Jonathan will show true love in the context of existing covenant between him and David and the Samaritan in his obvious regard for human life. Verse 36, Jesus said, Which now of these three, thinking thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? Now listen to this. Having finished his parable, Jesus countered the lawyer's question with one of his own. The lawyer had asked, Who is my neighbor? Jesus changed his question, question and shifted the focus to who acted like a neighbor. And so in Jesus' view, trying to identify a uh, wound to one is to call to love is an obvious attempt to relinquish responsibility. To do so is to reveal that one's motivation of trying to find ways to avoid obeying God rather than embracing the call to love as God loves. Verse 37, and he said, this is the lawyer talking now, he, the one, he that showed mercy on him. So the lawyer cannot bring himself to say the word Samaritan. As a Jew, he couldn't phantom the notion that a good, of a good Samaritan. But at least the lawyer grasped the point of Jesus' parable, recognizing the mercy and action that set the Samaritan apart from both the priest and the Levi. And just as the lawyer had answered right in the first exchange, so he answered correctly again with Jesus. However, his avoidance of saying the word Samaritan likely revealed that the lawyer still considered some people neighbors and others unworthy of that designation. Kind of remind you of us sometimes. We read God's word. We know what God's word, but we don't want to do what God said. A lot of us walk around with this old cliche of, I want to hear him say, well done, well God is not going to tell anybody well done that has not done well. To somehow think that you can do uh, leave undone everything that God told you to do and then do everything that God told you not to do, and yet somehow, some way, God is going to say well done. God is not going to tell anybody well done that hasn't done well. Verse 37 said, These, Then Jesus said unto him, Go and do thou likewise. So here is Jesus' final word. The lawyer appeared to be hoping that he could limit his responsibility by being a neighbor to only a select few. And with his profound parable, Jesus conveyed that rather than calculating who is a neighbor and who is not, the lawyer should heed Jesus' call to be a neighbor to whoever crossed your path. And that goes for you and I too. A neighbor is not somebody that you feel comfortable with. A neighbor is somebody that's in need that crosses your path in order to give you the opportunity to love as God loved. This is the only reference to the lawyer in the Bible. We don't know how he responded to Jesus and the gospel later on. He heard Jesus' message. Did he embrace it and act on it? Did he remember uh, if whenever a foul joke was told about a Samaritan or he encountered one on his road to Jericho? By asking the question, who is my neighbor? The lawyer in our text today was looking for a loophole. 
a loophole of being able to choose whom he was responsible to care about and care for. Surely God didn't intend for him to love all people. Surely some people did not merit his time and resources. Well, like the lawyer, we can be guilty of looking for a loophole too. When we hear the Bible's teachings about loving our neighbors as ourselves, we can grasp the meaning and principle that we are to love and serve people everywhere in need. But it's tempting to embrace uh, that as a theoretical concept. In other words, we know we're supposed to love our neighbors ourselves, but it takes actions and do to, deeds to carry that out, and we won't do that. So Jesus' parable of today's lesson leaves no room for self-justification. If we are looking for a way for self-justification, uh, we're, we're, we're looking for a way of loving that person who is uh, too difficult, uh, is too much trouble. Frankly, if the table were turned, they wouldn't love us in return. Then we betray our hearts and we do not love as God loved. So instead of looking for loopholes, let us search for opportunities to use what God has given us to bless all our neighbors. May God bless you and may God keep you is my prayer.